Hey bosses, just wanted to quickly tell you about our sponsor, Masterworks.io. Do you know that between the years 2000 and 2018, art has outperformed the S&P 500? Masterworks.io makes trading art as easy as trading stocks. We'll tell you more about them during the break. Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Hey, bosses. This is Johnny FD, and welcome to episode 161 of the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm out here in Sri Lanka in a house and Sam's also in a house. His, he actually owns. Welcome to the show. Uh, thanks, Johnny. We're not moving around too much this year, but I think we're both a little bit more comfortable. At least I am. <laughs> That's for damn sure. <laughs> yeah, me as well. I, I think this is the first time both of us have, have been in a proper house. Like I'm in a proper like, like villa house with furniture and you finally moved into your place. Yeah, I would say of the 161 episodes, What's the under over on us being in hotels or short term apartments for <laughs> the, yeah. the majority of those recordings? Probably 150 of those episodes were in sh- some type of short term accommodation, largely hotel rooms. Yeah, or the closet of someone's room, <laughs> <laughs> or parents' basement. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, it, we're, we're back on track. Uh, I even have some wine that I'm gonna I'm gonna crack open for the outro. Uh, but I think this is a topic that you've been wanting to talk about for a while, right? Oh, so long, man. The the the, the older I get, the more I get into wine. It's like wine. I feel like when's the first time you had a glass of wine, Johnny? Hmm. Oh. I want to say my, my college graduation is <laughs> the first time I okay. ever ordered. Like, seriously, like I probably tasted it before that, but I remember specifically the first time that I've ever ordered a bottle of wine or even maybe even a glass of wine at a restaurant was at this Italian restaurant for my college graduation. It was called Buca di Beppo. And I was so excited. I was like, I told my parents, I was like, look, like, you know, I know you guys are paying for this, but I graduated with the honors from a university. Like, let's let's get let's get one of these crafts. So we got a craft for wine. I had no idea how to order it. Uh, I just picked whatever the cheapest thing house wine was, and it was it was delicious. It was it was like you know twenty four years of of like pent up celebration. And I think if it wasn't for ordering wine and not having it on the, during the meal, it wouldn't have been complete. That's uh, so true. And it's really one of those things that. I, I feel for most people, it's acquired taste. It's like coffee. In college, I never drank coffee. I thought it was disgusting. I drank Red Bull. Never drank wine in college until probably the same as you, just college graduation. But as I've gotten older, and especially I've spent more time in places like Europe uh, and West Coast of California, uh, man, I've just grown such uh, intrigue and appreciation for good wine and for good coffee. I mean, they, if it's coffee to start my day and a good, gl- good glass of wine uh, to wind down and uh, kind of a settle in for the evening. Uh, wine is something that is so interesting as a lifestyle. And, and most recently, it's become really popular as an alternative investment uh, to people's in- investment portfolios. It's an alternative asset, just like we've covered art and we're going to co- cover collectible cars and cryptocurrencies and all these other things are becoming so popular to invest in recently. By the way, I just saw Bitcoin is at uh, 16,000, Johnny. I don't know if you you saw all that, but it's time to trade one of those in and go uh, have some fun with it. Uh, that was a tangent, but <laughs> what we're going to, we're going to bring on Tom Gearing in this episode. Great job to Derek for setting this up. And he's a CEO and founder of Cult Wines. Super interesting story and a really, really cool company. So we're going to talk broadly about uh, wine as an asset class. And of course, what the uh, investment opportunity is. Yeah. So I put in, you know, wine as one of those those collectible investments like Bitcoin, like art, like, you know, baseball cards. But it is interesting because it is non-correlated to the stock market, non-correlated to the real estate market. And I think it's one of those kind of fun luxury investments that people just like talking about. I mean, I think there's a certain level of of, uh, bragging rights to be able to say you own a you know, a really expensive vintage, uh, even though you're not going to drink it, or if you do drink it, maybe it won't taste very good anyways, because it's, 
you know, 20, 30 years old, <laughs> but it, it does, it does get bragging rights. So I think there is a certain uh, group of people out there that would be excited. Uh, so, you know, I'm excited to learn more, but I'll, I'll definitely uh, have my opinions during the outro along with my glass of wine. Sounds great. Well, I'm excited to bring Tom on. Let's hear it from him. Did you know that only 1% of day traders actually turn a profit? So why are so many of us mistakenly picking stocks for serious investing? You can't control the markets, but you can control your risks. So how do billionaire investors control their risk? They invest in blue chip art. If that sounds unusual to you, you're not alone. But the ultra wealthy have been investing in art for centuries. And from 2000 to 2018, art has outperformed the S&P by an incredible 180%. Just a few years ago, a single work sold for $450 million. Imagine being able to invest in the very same paintings as millionaires and billionaires at a fraction of the cost. Masterworks.io is an exclusive platform that makes it easy as trading stocks online. And the best part is, you don't need to know anything about art. Their experts will create a custom portfolio to meet your investment needs. With Masterworks.io, you don't have to choose between big risks and big returns. Sign up today and go to Masterworks.io, select podcast, and use code BOSS to skip the 70,000 person waiting list to get first dibs. Hurry, this offer expires soon. See important disclaimer at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Welcome back, Tom. It is awesome to have you on the show. Talk about some wine. No, I'm very glad to be here. Where are you uh, joining us from? Is it London? Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm in lockdown London as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> lockdown London. It's a good way to frame it. We were just talking to someone on your team, Mary, who's in lockdown New York City. Uh, so it's just, uh, I guess it's a good time to sit back and record an episode on, on wine and investing. Yeah. And when you're locked down at home, there's uh, no better excuse to open a nice bottle of wine, right? So <laughs> I've been, been doing a lot of that recently. And I'm sure just uh, <laughs> we've seen in the USA that that golf actually has had this massive resurgence because it's one of the few activities that you've been able to kind of do consistently and get out in nature and, and a bit of recreation. Uh, and we just know from our listeners as well that a lot of uh, peaked interest in wine uh, over the last year of 2020, people going out and exploring wines. And I'm, uh, I'm certainly testament to that, that trend. So later in the episode, it'll be interesting to get your views. But I wanted to, uh, to jump in quick as we, we get into this episode about cult wines and just wine as a topic. But there was a really interesting story that I, I read about you and your bio um, at a pretty young age. I think you're 13 that, that initially piqued your interest in wine. So I was hoping we could kind of start the, the episode and discussion, just exploring a little bit of that. Yeah. Well, I, I think, I think that story probably needs a, a tad of uh, context before I get into it. Cause obviously I think yeah. a lot of people will be listening on here thinking that I was a, uh, I was a, uh, you know, a, 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 youth, a youth drinking alcohol <laughs> who, who probably shouldn't have been, but um <laughs> So no, so the little bit of context to that is that um, I was very, very fortunate when I was growing up to sort of live in a family with my father, who's, who was a big wine aficionado and collector and enthusiast. And um, sort of when I was growing up, I was yeah, probably age of like 10, 11 years of 10 or 11, I, I, I uh, accompanied him on trips to, to, to various vineyards around Europe and in particular Burgundy, which was his, which was his passion. Um, and he was actually in the finance sector. So he worked for um, a bank in London, investment banking. And, and so, you know, he, he always sort of looked at wine as, as a very much as a passion for him, but he started to sort of move into it as, as a sort of a business. And he ended up setting up his, his own sort of wine business in the late 90s, early 2000s. But my sort of uh, story that you're referring to um, actually happened uh, uh, around the year 2000. And my father uh, attended an auction in London. I think it was a Christie's auction. And he, he won a bid uh, on a lot in the auction, which was a, and for, for listeners who, who know a little bit about wine, they'll, they'll recognize this name. And I'm sure it will come up later in our conversation. But Domaine de la Romney Conti, uh, probably, you know, the, the most revered Burgundy producer, uh, their top wine, which, which is the, the smallest production wine they make, is Romney Conti. Uh, he won an auction for a 12-bottle case of, of this wine, which is, which is quite rare to have a full 12-bottle set from the 1959 vintage. Um, which, which even at that time was, was quite a, a rarity. Um, and I think he paid around £16,000 for it back in 2000. And in, that, you know, in 2000, that was like an extremely high amount of money for, for a case of wine. I mean, nowadays, that particular wine sells for around 16000 per bottle. So wow. it's increased even more since then. Um, but, but the story you're referring to is he, he opened up the case. We brought it home. I remember 
bring it into our kitchen at home and he, he opened up the case really carefully and there was like you know uh, a little bit of sort of you know that tissue inside that we were, we were getting rid of and taking the bottles out and we took the first sort of the letters to, to the 12 bottle cases in two layers of six so you take the six first six bottles out he was taking photos inspecting them and was like oh wow great so he was about to put the bottles back in the case and then put it in the cellar and i was like oh should we not why don't we just check the, the, the bottom six bottles as well and he was like oh okay and he didn't really think he was going to even do it so we, we, we obviously uncovered the, the rest of the bottles to start taking them out. And, and I said to him, I was like, this is strange. And he was like, what's strange? And I was like, well, um, and this probably is my mathematical brain thinking. At the age of 13, I didn't really know much. So I said, why are the first six bottles all in numerical order, but these ones are in random order? And now, as soon as I said that, he realized that that means that this case could be counterfeit. Because if you have an original wooden case of 12 bottles from Domaine de Romney Conti, they come with serial numbers on the front. Mm. Um, and they should all be consequential. So they should run from, you know, a, a series of numbers going up or down, you know, in, in, an, in, order, in an order of 12. And of course, the, the first six were in an order of six, and then the others were completely random. So that meant immediately, you know, alarm bells were ringing in terms of, okay, well, this means that this isn't the original 12 bottles. It means it's been repacked. This isn't how it was sold originally at auction. And obviously with these type of wines, um, you know, with, with the levels of, uh, potential counterfeiting of, and fraudulent activity there is in the wine market, you, you know, you can't take your chances. So he ended up calling up Chris, Christie's who were caught off guard because they didn't even um, realize it when they were doing their checks. Um, mm. And they offered to to take the case back and, and give a full refund um, because they couldn't then guarantee the provenance, provenance of the wine. So that, that was the, uh, that was my experience at a sort of a young age. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it stood, stood me in a good, uh, good stead for the rest of my career. Um, you know, especially when dealing with, with older rarer wines. My gosh, what a crazy initial experience. And then uh, very, very smart of you to be able to point that out at such a young age and make that observation. So I guess in that scenario, the only winner was uh, the counterfeiter because they originally were selling that wine to Christie's or somebody else that got it to Christie's. I never thought of fraud in the wine market. I don't know why, like you see it everywhere else. I mean, who's making that stuff? Is it like other wine producers that actually are making this fraud or, I mean, it's not, it's not the same people making the fake Louis Vuitton bags. Well, I mean, see the thing about fraudulent counterfeit wines, is it really does take many, many guises. And, I, and I'm, I'm sure some of your listeners here will, will probably be thinking themselves, yeah, I've seen a Netflix documentary about it called Sour Grapes. And I'd, I'd recommend the listeners wow, and even okay. yourself, if you haven't um, had a chance to watch it, because even if you're not into wine, it's one of those great sort of real life crime sort of documentaries. Uh, it just happens to be around the rare refined wine, um, you know, rare refined um sex of fine wine you know buying and collecting um so at one extreme which is what that documentary is about it's about an individual who was creating uh bottles of rare wines where he was actually manufacturing them so this guy had a lot of exposure to wine he was actually in auctions buying real bottles of wine um but he actually came up with like a recipe list so he would say for example um you know like i said domain de romani conti 59 and he would basically create a, a way to recreate the taste of that particular wine. It might include like a bit of a Californian Cabernet from the, from the seventies from a height cellar. And it might include a little bit of like a modern day Burgundy, but you know, he would concoct a mix of wines and then rebottle or relabel wines that he'd bought officially through auction. So it was a really sort of hard to detect type of fraud because he was, he was sort of well known within his communities as being a, a collector and a taster and someone he bought and sold at auction. And, you know, when you get to that level of wine, you know, it's subjective because first of all, like there isn't any sort of, um, you know, there isn't really any laid out mass availability of some sort mm -hmm. of procedure or process in which you can actually taste or test the contents of the bottle and actually say whether that's verifiably the, the exact same wine that it should be. So a lot of this comes down to subjectivity. And the other thing that makes it really difficult is some of these wines, which, which are really old and rare, not many people have ever drunk. So you haven't got a lot of reference points to really compare it to. Yeah. And the other factor is, you know, wine is, is, a, is a living organism in that, you know, it's a perishable good, you know, it is affected by temperature, is affected by movement, is affected by sunlight. And so you can get a perfectly authentic, real bottle of wine that came from the actual vineyard, has been stored in various cellars around Europe or around the world. But, you know, if it happens to sit on the truck at 35 degrees Celsius in, you know, Arizona for, you know, six hours between going from the importer to the, to the collector's home, then that wine could well be spoiled. And at the time that someone ends up buying that wine and drinking it, 
um, you know, the wine's off anyway. So it's, it's a really difficult area of the market. But just to summarize that particular incident, um, he actually ended up getting, um, uh, getting found out because he tried to counterfeit a wine from a producer called Lauren Ponzo. And the vintage of the wine that he put into auction, uh, I think it was with Acker's or wine auctions, uh, was actually a, um, a vintage which they never made. So the winemaker was like, well, that's, that, that's, I guarantee that's fake. And the auction house was like, well, how do you know it's fake if you haven't inspected it? And he was like, we never made that wine in that year. So he ended up getting a bit too cocky. He obviously, you know, was, was, was sort of right in the midst of it and ended up getting tripped up by, by his own, uh, by his own uh, procedures. Wow. Very interesting stories. And it just shows the show, you got to know what you're doing, just like in any business. And I guess before we jump into more about cult wines and the, the investment perspective is just in, interested to know a little bit more about just wine as a general asset and wine as a general topic. You know, there's all these stories of, uh, I guess, you know, friends of parents and, and um, people in the kind of the extended family network that had a, a kind of a tough job their whole life or a cutthroat business. And then they wanted to buy a vineyard and retire um, and they don't realize that it's actually a ton of work. It's not, it's just like a bed and breath. It's not as easy and as dreamy as it seems on the outside. But from your experience, I mean, is there, is there a lot of money to be made in starting a vineyard or owning and operating a vineyard? Uh, or do, do most of them just kind of break even or, or operate more as a, as a passion project? Well, I mean, if, you, if, you t if you're looking at the, the spectrum of, of, of like different types of winery products and locations and, and regions and price points and, and grape varieties, you know, they're, they're, there's a different answer to that question in every different guise. But I think generally, I think generally to retire and sort of move into wine and sort of make it your pastime, I think that you would be naive to go into it thinking that you're going to suddenly, you know, create the next big thing and, and, and make mm -hmm. a huge profit from it. Um, you know, a lot of people joke about, you know, how do you make a small fortune? Well, you start with, start with a large fortune and you buy a winery to retire into and that will certainly <laughs> eat, up, eat up the money quite quickly, right? So um, I don't think it's easy and, and straightforward. And, you know, really when it comes down to, um, you know, making, you know, going into a vineyard business where you're actually trying to create a brand and, and create a strategic route to market and actually to develop, you know, a customer base and then generate a profit and then make it, you know, a really profitable exercise. It is, it is a long-term investment and, and it is going to take and require a lot of commitment and a lot of investment. And I think those people that go into it with the right type of mentality, you know, this is something that will take, you know, 10, 15, 20 years to, to make a return on investment, then, then those are the people that, you know, will, will do well out. But I think if you go into the short term mentality as a lifestyle purchase, it's going to be very, very difficult to, to make something very profitable, unless you happen to buy something that was already an established winery and an established vineyard and established brand name. But then you're talking about, you know, significant amount of money, right? And then you're probably going to be in a level of wealth where, to be honest, making money out of a winery is probably going to be the least of your worries. So, there you go. It's 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 certainly not the the easiest or straightforward um, you know business to go into. Yeah, and I guess too, it's it's very much a volume play. There's uh, I was down in Chile uh, half dozen years ago and had this fantastic Carmenere, and I inquired with the 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 vineyard that made it, and they only make ten thousand bottles, and they're selling retail for twenty bottle twenty dollars a bottle. So top line revenue on that is a hundred grand, and that was the only wine that they made. Uh, so the, there's just not enough numbers in there to make a lot of money. So that I'm assuming has to be uh, very much a, a passion project. Um, yeah. I mean, also you've got to think about the, the, the land costs, like, you know, yeah. the, especially in Europe, like places like Burgundy and Champagne. I mean, with some of the height, I mean, like, for example, let's look at, um, let's look at um, Stan Cronkley, who, you know, obviously is famous in America for being, you know, part of the Walmart family, obviously married into the sports franchises and obviously owns Arsenal over here in the UK. I mean, he, he recently bought Bono de Matre, um in, in Burgundy and uh, he paid, you know, 6.25 million euros per hectare. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking about exceptional prices at that level to so even start making a profit is, is, is going to be, it's going to be a tough ask. For sure. Well, Tom, a few quick questions just on understanding wine and a little bit more about the, the you know, the geo scene, which is a country currently selling the most wine by volume? So, I mean, if you're talking about exporting, mm -hmm. um, I think France, Italy, and Spain are the, are the largest exporters in value. I think France is, is edging it over Italy. 
Uh, but France and Italy, in terms of pure export sales of fine wine, of, of not fine wine, of wine in general, full stop, you know, France and Italy. If you're talking more about the, the sort of global value of fine wine sold as a sort of a, as a consumer good, um, I mean, the last sort of estimations that I, I saw in a report, you know, estimated the global wine market to be worth about 350 billion globally. And the US was was top of that list in wine sales at around uh, just under 50 billion wow, uh, dollars. And then, and then after that, it was France, Italy, um, China, and the UK, which were all around sort of the twenty-five billion uh, dollar mark. So, if you're just talking about you know pure consumer fine, you know, not again, I keep saying fine wine because that's my area of business, but just consumer sort of wine sales. Um, you know, it's quite a large market globally at three hundred and fifty billion. And where do you see the, the the new, the most expensive wines that are not vintage wines that are just being produced? Uh, I guess in recent years, coming out of. Um, so I mean, the most uh, in, in, in terms of your question, you're asking a vintage wine. I mean, all wines will be vintage because that's the year that they're made in. So in oh, terms I'm, of, I'm, I'm sorry, I meant like older wines that are not. You know, what what would you call wine from say 2005? Well, a wine in 2005 is a 2005 vin, vintage, vintage wine, I suppose. Yeah. But yeah, but I, in, in, uh, let me ask you uh, ask your question in 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 another way. Um, the most expensive wines right now uh, are coming out of Burgundy. I mean, that's if you look at the secondary market for trading wines, you know, Burgundy, you know, if you look at the top 20 most expensive wines in the world, um, I actually had a look at this earlier, um, only six wines on that top 20 list are not from Burgundy. So wow. Burgundy really dominating the top end of the market. And, you know, we're talking about serious amounts of money per, per bottle. We're talking you know, in the range of, you know, at the bottom of that 20, top 20 is about $5,000 and at the top is about $20,000. Um, and, you know, when anybody start going past that, you know, Burgundy continues to dominate, but you start seeing some, some other regions come into it. Um, so, you know, that, that's really where the top end of the market is. And what, what's driving the prices of, of those wines that much higher? Is it, is it prestige? Is it, is it strictly flavor and quality? What do you think that, that the price factors are there? Well, I think any any sort of uh, any sort of market dynamics are going to be down to supply and demand, and and, and it just so happens that a lot of the, the top Burgundy wines are made in very very small production. So you know you have very much limited supply products from day one, uh, where you have huge oversubscription worldwide to actually get hold of them and, and, and obtain those wines. And the people that do actually take an allocation of those wines, they aren't necessarily going to be reselling them anytime soon. They might be putting them in their cellar for a long time. So you take a product with an already limited supply upon the initial primary release into the marketplace, so then it's distributed globally. So you then have a, you know, a fragmented uh, distribution uh, supply of that particular wine. And, you know, maybe only 10, it's a bit like an iceberg, you know, what you'll see on the market might only be 10% of the total supply. So it's an even smaller amount that's actually available to, to be bought and sold. Uh, and, and Burgundy in particular has got the prestige in terms of the history, uh, the gravitas, um, you know, from an investment perspective, you know, it, you know, the, the performance has been spectacular over the last sort of 10, 15 years. So, and, and from a qualitative perspective, as you, as you asked, you know, Pinot Noir is probably, you know, the most revered grape variety right now, uh, which is, you know, predominantly the red wines from, from Burgundy, you know, a hundred percent Pinot Noir varietal. Um, so if you add all those factors in together, you know, you're talking about some vineyards that have been around for four or 500 years, that are luxury goods in, in, in everything um, that they are in terms of their brand with, with minute availability and actually quite difficult to obtain and difficult to source or even get hold of. So you add all those factors in together and it, it, it results in stratospheric prices. I'd say on top of that, what we've also seen in the wine market is, you know, a globalization of the wine market, you know, the fine wine market, which maybe 20 years ago was dominated by, you know, UK, Europe and, and North America. In the last 20 years, we've seen a seismic um, shift in terms of the power um, of, of, of Asia, um, you know, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, you know, these are significant wine trading hubs. But we've also started to see that, um, you know, interest and demand uh, dissipate into the other areas around, you know, uh, Southeast Asia. So, you know, other, other regions like Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, you know, you've seen a lot of wealth, a lot of uh, uh, you know, a lot of new money, a lot, lot of, you know, people who want to drink and acquire these wines. So for a market where, you know, you can't necessarily increase the amount that they produce, you know, the, the supply side is pretty much fixed and actually it's variable depending on the weather and the climatic conditions on a year to year basis. We're also seeing on the demand side, you know, more and more people in the world being interested in, in, in investing and, and collecting and drinking fine wine. 
Um, so you can understand how if you keep on increasing the demand side of this of this you know imbalance, that prices are inevitably going to rise. I, I was actually surprised. I looked up um, the largest wine producers in the world just recently, and I'm not sure if this is accurate, but it said that the, I think the top one was Great Wall, uh, which is produced by China, and of course there's some of the big American brands like Sutter Home and. Um, uh, and then there's Yellowfin in, in Australia. But China is always surprising because it's the same with beer. You're, a lot of people aren't familiar with the Chinese beer brands, but Snow and uh, Singstow, I believe, are the number one and number two selling beers in the entire world. Most people haven't heard of them just because there's such a huge consumer market there. And I guess the same was true with, uh, with their Great Wall, Great Wall label. And I think there may have been another one that was also produced in China that I'd never heard of. But um, yeah, the the um, you're absolutely right about the the take up of, uh, you know, the middle class and consumerism yeah. in in Asia. Absolutely, uh, I'm curious to know a little bit about these really expensive bottles and what happens when some of these bottles go bad. You know, in in the U.S., we buy a lot of our wine from Total Wine, kind of in the you know just the big retailer. If there's a bad bottle that's 50 bucks, you simply just take it back and they'll, they'll replace it or give you a credit. Some of these bottles are like 10, $20,000. How can you even verify that it's bad and what type of recourse is there? Um, or do you just assume the risk when you buy a bottle that's that expensive? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really great question. And it's a bit of a gray area to be honest with you. And I think that I'd approach answering that question in sort of two different ways. One is obviously from like an investor mentality perspective. So I think, how you invest in wines probably going to be different to how you want to just buy wines for consumption. So I think mm -hmm. in, in, in the, the sort of the latter part of that, you know, buying wines for consumption and then sort of the example you gave with total wine, I think as a consumer, it really depends on, on who you're dealing with and also what their relationship is with the winery. I mean, I know a lot of wineries that, that deal direct with, you know, established importers or, or agents in a particular region, you know, if there is fault to be found with their wines, which, which is, you know, a, a winemaker's fault, and this is where the gray area comes into it. You know, it needs to be something that can be, you know, pointed at as being a winemaker's fault. Um, you know, often those winemakers, if they're working with an agent, will be happy to sort of replace them. So, like, I mean, I think a good example would be a Burgundy producer called Domaine de Fleuve, who's quite well known, big, big production, really high quality wines. You know, some of the agents that they work with, you know, if there's a bottle with, with an issue, TCA, or, you know, maybe a cork issue, for example, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll replace that wine. Um, and they did that in the knowledge of knowing that, you know, it's going to be a relatively small percentage of their overall production that's going to have that. But mm. from a retailer's perspective, it's difficult because, you know, does every person who buy the wine and ends up with a bottle of wine on their table, are they, are they going to be able to identify where the fault is and what is the, what is the cause of the fault? You know, could it have been the transport? Could it have been, as I mentioned earlier, the example of, you know, maybe a, a case of wine being on a, on a truck for too long in 35 degrees heat in, in Arizona, for example? You know, it, it doesn't take a long time for a wine to be exposed to too high temperatures for that to have a detrimental and long-lasting impact on, on the quality of the wine. In fact, an irreversible impact on the quality of the wine. Um, so it really is difficult. And I think, you know, as retailers, you know, they will have insurance policies in place. They'll probably have, uh, you know, some sort of, um, you know, they'll probably have some sort of budget in place to actually, you know, replace wines or have, you know, some sort of contingency in place for, you know, 40 wines or wines they have to replace. And they'll probably build that into their margins. So, you know, if you're making 20, 30% margins across your retail wines that you're selling and you're, you know, working out on average that maybe, you know, one in 50 is going to have an issue, then, you know, the maths works out that, you know, you can sort of build in a contingency budget to, to make up for, make up for those issues. And obviously as a retailer, you're probably going to want to deliver a great service to your client. Mm. I think where it becomes a little bit more difficult is in the realm of rarefied area of fine wine and, and, and it's expensive wines and old wines, because, you know, who's, who's, who is the, uh, whose responsibility is it once a wine gets to 20, 30 years of age, you know, uh, we you know, we can do uh, you know in my in my in my perspective we can do everything we we can in our in our power to check the provenance and the, the authenticity of a wine and even the conditions that the wine's been checked in. Good example, we recently went into Luxembourg and bought a big seller of wines from a collector over there. You know, hundreds of cases of wine, all of top top quality uh, products and. Obviously, we're not going to open every single bottle of wine. So obviously, we wouldn't have anything to sell, right? Obviously, it'd be a good, it'd be a good, a good, good trip. But you know, we had to selectively choose, you know, a few bottles here and there across the cellar, across different regions of producers. And you know, we probably tasted maybe ten or twelve wines from the total cellar, and we were like, yeah, great, this has been fantastic. We actually saw the physical location where the wines were. 
temperature control. We saw the original invoices. We saw the original dispatch dates. We knew they'd been there for that period of time, mm-hmm. and the quality was good. But there's nothing. Sometimes you can't legislate for, for for certain elements, which is you know you open up a bottle of you know 1980s Mouton, and you know the cork crumbles, and oh you know one of them might be corked or oxidized because that's just you know likely to happen when you're dealing with you know older wines and. I put like for me, I, I'm a wine, I'm a wine enthusiast. I love wine. You know, I spend my time geeking out on it. And mm-hmm. I, for me, just I just play those averages. Like I know that unfortunately, sometimes when you do spend a bit of money on wine, you know, one in twenty, one in ten, it, it's going to maybe be a bad bottle. Um, right. And you sort of got to accept it. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I, I I recently went over and bought a bottle. It was like a, a year two thousand bottle of Chianti. I'd never really gotten into Italian wines, just a, a whole new world to explore. Um, <laughs> and I tasted it, and I'm like, this is this is off. This is way off. <laughs> and I ca- I called the retailer. I'm like, uh, yeah, it's, there's something wrong with. It. He's like, well, bring it in, and uh, you know, I'll take a look at it and see. I took it into him, and he tasted it. In his face, just melted. He was like. Oh, that is just spectacular. He's like, it's just perfect. Really? <laughs> and I'm like, wow. he's like, what he's like, what kind of what kind of grapes are you used to having? I'm like, you know, Napa cabs. He's like, oh yeah. He's like, yeah, your your flavor profile. If you're not used to this, he's like, he gave us a recipe and my girlfriend went home, cooked up that recipe. He's like, have it with that. And I had a glass that night and I'm like, wow, that is the best tasting wine I've ever had. So also like food pairing makes a huge difference. And I think often in North America. This is a general statement, but I think people are so used to just drinking Napa cabs without food, just enjoying the actual the flavor. And um, I think with so many wines in the world, you really got to pair it correctly to get the most out of it. But also, like on your point, and, and this is something I was thinking, like, you know, maturity levels, like different grape varieties from different regions mature at different rates. And so, you know, what I often see, and, and probably one of the biggest sort of mistakes that people make is everyone just thinks, oh, the older the wine, the better it gets. And it's just not mm-hmm. true because certain grape varieties from certain regions might, and from certain levels of terroir and vineyards, they, they might be better drunk younger within a four, five or six, seven year window. And actually, once they get past maybe 10 years of age, you're probably going to get a, get a lot worse. And okay, this Chianti you, you're talking about will actually turn out quite well. But I, I'd hasten to, to guess that a lot of sort of Chianti Classicos that are 20 years of age now are probably maybe some of them are going to be over the hill. You know, some of their best days might have already been behind them. So that's another factor really, really, really to consider, um, you know, when it, when it comes to drinking, you know, old, older wines. And I just realized I didn't actually answer your question about sort of how you protect yourself. And, you know, from an investment perspective, and I think this is a really important point, you know, when it comes to wines and the sort of the age of them, you know, from an investment perspective, we look at it and that's one of the factors that we sort of evaluate, which is sort of maturity rates of the wines that we're investing into. You know, we would never you know because we, we we sort of look at it from a risk adjusted returns perspective you know once a wine gets older and we understand the maturity profile of those wines of that great variety in that particular region we are not necessarily going to invest people into a wine where we think it's only got another window of another three or four years left mm-hmm. before actually it's going to be past its peak so that's a big consideration for us when it comes to investing and second of all um you know when you're investing in wine you know the recommendation really is to be buying wines that are in you know a tax advantage uh, warehousing facility so you're not actually paying for the duties and import taxes of bringing them in as a physical good. Um, you're also not going to take them outside the professional warehousing facility. So you know that it's got, you know, perfect temperature control, perfect humidity control, perfect light conditions. And, you know, if it matures in that environment for 10, 15, 20 years, you're going to absolutely maximize uh, the quality and the provenance and the condition of those wines. So when you do come to resell them, because obviously you're not going to be consuming them, but when you do come to resell them, you're going to maximize the potential value you're going to get out of them. And, and also the other thing, you know, and this, this might sound a, a, a bit harsh, but if you're an investor and you're buying a wine and it's in its original casing, it hasn't been opened, it's in a bonded warehouse, which is probably something that will be unknown to your listeners, but a tax-free uh, environment, mm-hmm. When you come to resell that, you resell it as a tax-free good that's an original case. And the person you buy and buys it is also buying the wines as a physical good that haven't been opened. You know, your responsibility as an investor for those wines has been passed on. So even if that, that wine eventually got sold to someone in Singapore, who then opened it and drank it, you know, your responsibility as an investor is, is long past. So it's not like they're going to come back to you and say, right, you know, you owe me money because this bottle turned out to be, you know, corked, for example. Right, right. Tom, awesome business you built. I'm excited to hear a little bit more about it. Uh, you're a relatively young guy, proper millennial, I believe. Uh, really impressive operation at Colt Wines. Can you give us a little bit of, um, you know, wh- where you guys are at today and what the, you know, how you engage with different investors? Yeah, it's, 
you know, I, I mean, I started the company whilst I was at university and, um, and I left university in 2009. So I've, I've sort of been managed, well, I've been managing and I'm the sort of co-owner, co-founder since, since 2009, so 10 years and the 10 year anniversary passed recently. And, uh, I realized that we'd sold uh, a third of a billion dollars worth of wine in that last 10 years. So, um, it was quite, quite amazing to see that how much, how much wine we'd bought, you know, uh, how much wine we'd sold during that period of time. But when we first, I think this is, I think this is true today as it was on the first day we started, like the whole reason we started this business is that, you know, my, my personal experience, I knew that there was a value in wine as an investable asset and I knew it can provide benefits to investors by including a, you know, uh, an allocation to, to wine as an alternative asset class. But I looked at the market and I looked at it from two spectrums. One, if you already are a wine aficionado or somebody who already is a wine collector or somebody who's already engaged in wine as a collector, I felt that the services and the op opportunities and, and the products and the platforms that were available weren't necessarily uh, fit for purpose for an investor perspective. You know, they're fit for purpose for total wine. I want to buy a great bottle of wine, have it on my dinner table. But in terms of where you could actually go to build a collection of wine for investment, there wasn't really anything out there. There wasn't really a product or service that was providing that. And then I looked at it on the flip side, which was, well, sh why, investing in wine shouldn't necessarily be for people that, already know a lot about wine have a lot of experience and knowledge because you know wine can offer huge amounts of benefits to everyone's portfolio so we looked at it from two angles one we need to try and make wine more accessible to a wider audience so i think from the from the first day to even what is true today we had two missions one making wine more accessible as an investor asset class or wider audience and the other thing that we looked at was how can we make investing in wine look and feel more like a regulated asset class much more like a viable asset class how can we help to transform the way that people look at it and manage it and trade it and and what are the ways we can do that so that's where we started back in you know as i said uh, sort of 2009 when i when i left university and as of today they are still what we hold very true to everything we do on a day-to-day -day basis of course you know, how that looks and feels has, has changed. And obviously we've pivoted and obviously data and technology is a much bigger part of what we do versus say 10 years ago, but we're still driven. You know, we're quite restless here. You know, we, we, we always want to do more. We always want to improve what we're doing. We always want to look at the competition and see how can we push things further. And at the moment, you know, what we're really trying to do is, is, is incorporate data and technology into serving our investors in, in, a, in, a, in a more effective way. So, in terms of what we do uh, today, you know, our core proposition is a managed portfolio service. And that is investors come to us with zero to a lot of knowledge about wine. And we understand what their appetite for risk is, how this fits in with their asset allocation, what sort of length of term they want to be invested for, what sort of returns are they looking for, what degree of risk they might want to take. And of course, you know, what sort of knowledge and passion do they have about wine, but maybe on a slightly secondary element is, is that side of things. And we build diversified portfolios of fine wine for, for individuals. Um, I would say typically our clientele would probably be more sort of mass affluent to high net worth individuals. We've, I have over the years stayed away from the retail investor market. Um, my personal opinion is that wine market has a lot of limitations to it, which, which, which can be a positive and a negative. One of the limitations for the wine market is it's quite illiquid, excuse the pun. But, you know, it's not a tradable asset like, you know, stocks and shares where you can buy and sell and there's, you know, a, a, you know, a clearing price on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, wines are assets that you need to find match buyers and sellers for. So they aren't immediately, um, you know, it isn't something you can immediately trade. Um, and for those reasons, I've always felt that, you know, a large retail base of investors investing in smaller amounts wouldn't necessarily work for this market because I think it's something that you need to come into um, as you know, I've sort of already invested in stocks and shares, I've already got my bonds, I've already got in the sort of traditional areas. Now I want to diversify. Now I want to maybe put, you know, 10, 15, 25K. And then obviously as you get up into your higher wealth brackets, obviously larger amounts of money. We are ironically um, sort of working with a partner in the US to actually target the retail investor market a little bit more. Um, so there's a company called Rally Road, uh, who I, I don't know if you guys have come across, who are sort of offering fractional ownership of, of, of assets they originally started with, with sort of collectible cars and have started mm -hmm. to move into more sort of memorabilia and collectibles and we are their exclusive partner with wine and that's a really interesting concept for me for the retail investor market because they're, they're using really intelligent um, software in their app and, and their technology and, and a structure which allows sort of fractional ownership so i mean we we've, we've released maybe half a dozen wines on their platform already but you know a, a case of petra 16 you know, which costs the best part of, you know, $25,000, you know, if you're mm -hmm. buying it yourself, 
they're splitting up into, you know, a thousand shares of $25. So suddenly, you know, you get a much bigger audience being able to buy small pieces of, of, of that wine, which is great. Mm -hmm. But in terms of what we do and what we've always uh, used as our USP is we're a professional investment manager of wine. You know, we build diversified portfolios where the individual client owns the underlying asset. So we're not a fund, we're not a fractional ownership, people actually own the underlying asset. And we apply investment management processes to the way that we work. So for example, we have uh, relationship managers, we have portfolio managers, we have an investment director, we have an investment committee. And so we have a top-down asset management approach, which means that it doesn't matter if you're a client of ours in Chengdu in China or Singapore or Indonesia or Philippines or you know uh, California, New York, Europe, wherever it might be, you know as a client of cold wines, you're getting a consistent approach to investment management and portfolio management when it comes to investing in your wines. And of course, we now you know, look to underpin uh, you know, that approach with product, platform and technology. And of course, what's essential to that is being able to access you know, unique proprietary data, which luckily over the last 10 years, we've done a fantastic job at, at building up. So you know, we feel that our performance speaks for itself. Um, over the last decade, we've averaged uh, around 8% per annum uh, to our clients, which, you know, mm. if you compare it to where we are currently with sort of interest rates is, is I think, you know, quite exceptional. Uh, but what really excites me is not necessarily the gross total return. It's actually the, the volatility. You know, we've experienced um, on average around 5 to 6% volatility as standard deviation in our portfolios, which basically means that wine prices are fairly stable. You know, you should be expecting slow, stable growth. You're not seeing, I know, look, look at the equity markets in the last day or so since the vaccine announcement. You know, it's been going crazy. Things have been going up 10, 15, 20% in a day and things have also been going down that much. And we saw that at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. You know, prices for the stock markets globally dropped hugely. I know obviously they've recovered since then. But if you look at wine prices, wine prices stayed stable. You know, they dropped maybe one or two percentage points in the March and April. And by the end of the summer, you know, they were in sort of three to 4% positive territory. So mm -hmm. wine has always got that built-in diversification and uncorrelation with the global equity, equity and economy, uh, economic markets, which mm -hmm. really is its, its selling point as a diversification tool. Yeah, fine wine, certainly in demand in good times and uh, certainly in demand in pandemics as well. Um, Tom, what are the range of, of size of portfolios that people have with you, the investors have with you, and how long are people typically holding on to these portfolios before liquidating them and trying to strike a return? Yeah, great question. So, um, so our, you know, our flagship uh, offering is the managed account service. So the, the managed account service, you know, starts from 10,000. So, you know, people can get in uh, at that level. At the point at which we, uh, you, you get appointed a portfolio manager and you get the customization, that comes at 25,000. So, uh, you know, the managed account service, you still get access to, you know, our capacity, our liquidity, you know, our data, our insights, our research and reports from a 10,000 level. But as you go up through the tier levels of our account sizes, you get additional sort of benefits and features and, and, and different sort of uh, things you can do with it. Um, but in terms of our sort of uh, current AUM, we, we manage uh, $200 million worth of wine um, for clients in more than 70 different countries. Uh, and the average portfolio size at the moment is, is around $120,000. But I wouldn't like necessarily see that as a, an obstacle or, you know, a big number to look at and go, I, I I'm not necessarily going to be starting at $120,000 because with wine market, with wine market, you know, it's, it's a life, it, it, you know, it's, it's a long-term investment. You know, some of our clients who, who've got say a quarter of a million of us, you know, they even started at sort of 10, 20, $30,000, five, six, seven years ago. And they invested regularly. They, they, they used the ability to dollar average down their investments over time. And, and they built it, built it up and tested it out, saw the performance, and then sort of slowly increased, increased their portfolio size. Um, so, you know, I say 120,000 is our average, which it is, but it's not like, oh, day one, 120,000 is our typical right. initial investment size. Right, got it. Are all of your investment investors financial investors, or do some of them just after a few years say, "Nah, just ship it to me, and I'm gonna I'm gonna drink it"? You know, I think that you know when people come into this as 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 an investment, like we, you know, we 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 have very few clients who have zero interest in wine. You know, mm -hmm. I'd say people even at the lowest level, it's going to be like, well, at least I drink wine at home. Okay, so everyone has a certain level of interest in wine, all the way up to people that are super passionate about it. So I think everyone comes into it with a little bit of an idea of saying, 
well, worst case scenario, I own the wine so I can drink them, right? So that's not necessarily the, men- that's not necessarily the mentality we want people to come into it with. But, it, but it is a, it's a good psychological one because at the end of the day, you are buying a physical asset. You are owning bottles and cases of wine that you actually genuinely own. Like if all the world were turned upside down tomorrow, which is sort of what happened in the last year anyway, but yeah. let's say it was even more drastic than that and everyone stopped drinking wine, you know, you still own these bottles. You still can, you know open them up if you wanted to but in answer to your actual question like what is the realistic numbers of people that are taking these wines out for drinking it, it ends up becoming quite a small percentage and i would say that it realistically it's often people that have generated a fantastic profit and have said you know what i put a hundred thousand dollars into this you know i've made a 50 percent profit instead of giving me all the 50 percent profit back i'm going to maybe take ten thousand dollars worth of wine out drink that and i'll have the rest back in you know capital and you know, and sort of uh, as, and, as profit generated so Quite often, it's that type of mentality. Um, so yeah, I'd probably say less than ten percent actually ends up getting consumed by the actual investors. But that doesn't necessarily mean that those clients aren't engaging with it in a different way. Yeah, that seems like such a good plan. Take profits and and celebrate with some of that fine wine. Uh, when Bitcoin crossed ten thousand, that's what exactly we did. Sold a Bitcoin in Hong Kong for cash. Put it in an ATM. Spit out cash and went and consumed a few of the the best bottle of uh, bottles of wine we could find in Hong Kong. Got to, got to celebrate those wins. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> this was actually a question from our Patreon was, uh, it, so it's not an actual fund that you can invest in. It's a managed portfolio that is, it's your portfolio. It's not put in 50,000 and that goes into a larger fund. Uh, and then you can, you just, you take a, a return on that, but it's not your own portfolio. Is that a correct understanding? Yeah. So we, yes, yeah, a managed account. So okay. every mm-hmm. single portfolio is individualized to the investor. Got it. And I saw you guys had offices in Hong Kong, London, Shanghai, Singapore. Are those all operational centers? So you would store it and you would also manage relationships for maybe those regions out of those offices? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we've got teams on the ground in in Shanghai, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, London, and and in New York as well. we, once we got, we've incorporated the business, we're already trading in, 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 in the US. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we were supposed to uh, open and launch our office in around May uh, of this year. And obviously mm-hmm. that's had to be sort of postponed and delayed. So we're hoping Q1 of next year when things look a little bit better and some of the restrictions have been pulled down maybe a little bit, um, you know, we, we can launch. But it will, it will definitely be next year, obviously, mm-hmm. the pandemic permitting. But we yeah. know we are, we are, um, you know, we are, we have boots on the ground, uh, as they say, in terms of, you know, personnel in, in North America and, and obviously client base. So right. yeah, we, we're sort of covering the whole globe now. Great. And Tom, is there any restrictions on who can invest in open accounts with you guys in terms of accredited investors and international? No, 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 no restrictions at all. I mean, fundamentally people are buying physical cases of wine that they own. So whilst we wrap it up in a portfolio of management investment management service, they are, it's not a security, you know, they actually are buying physical cases and bottles of wine that will be stored and registered with the UK government as being their title and ownership. So yeah, uh, yeah no restrictions. Um, investor, uh, investors and listeners will love that. There's so many restrictions, uh, especially in, to North American investors with uh, being accredited, et cetera. That's why I think of some of these alternative assets are getting really, really popular. It gives some, something new to look at, something that people can get enthusiastic about. And also just the access level uh, is, is super important. Um, Tom, just getting closer to the end of the episode, I, I just I wanted to get your view on you know, what you're doing. Uh, I recently watched a, a masterclass that was recorded by James Suckling. I didn't know anything yeah. about James Suckling prior to. It was an amazing you know, bit of content. And it just looked like he had the best life ever. You know, he's traveling around Tuscany. He's got resources and contacts all over these great estates and he's basically just being shipped wine from every great producer in the world to test all day um it just looked amazing i mean from from your perspective of what you're doing it looks amazing i'm sure it's not all uh, kittens and roses all day every day i know it's it's a business and with businesses comes challenges but could you see yourself doing anything different i mean is this is this really what your your dream uh career per se would be uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of those sort of well turned out phrases that people say, you know, if you, if you find, if you, if you end up finding a passion, you find that earning a living out of your passion, then it never feels like you've ever worked. And, you know, I generally do look back at the last decade and, you know, not only has the time gone extremely quick, but 
I've, I've never felt like it's a job. I've never felt like it's work for me, even though, as you said, there are challenges, you know, even that first sort of few years when it's like scrappy startup environment and you're literally just, just fighting to keep the light, you know, the lights on and make sure that you can pay all your bills at the end of the month. So now obviously being in a completely different stratosphere in terms of what we're doing as a business, but yeah, it's been a, a remarkable time period and, and something I've really enjoyed. I think for me, I think that I'm as much of an entrepreneur as I am, you know, passionate about being in the wine industry and, you know, I've, I've always wanted to sort of run my own projects and do my own things. And I just have the opportunity now as we expand to sort of look at other opportunities, different products and services we can bring out. So it's almost being entrepreneurial within this environment of actually working within wine. And I think, again, as I, I said to you earlier on, you know, I think one of our core values as a team is, is being restless. You know, we, we always look at the wine market and think, you know, what could be done better? You know, what else can, what else can we try and do? You know, what else can we do to improve our products and service for our customers? You know, what other opportunities are there out there? And that for me is the exciting thing because I get to combine both my passion for being an entrepreneur and, and sort of doing my own thing and running my own projects, but also being able to be attached to wine. And as you said, you know, get to enjoy the finer things in life, which is certainly a, a massive bonus of, of the job. <laughs> Sounds incredible. Tom, congrats on the great business you've built. Hopefully it continues to pay financial and lifestyle dividends for many, many decades to come. I could totally see you doing this uh, well into your 80s, 90s and beyond. So uh, very cool. Really enjoyed having you on the show. Is there anything you want to leave the listeners with before we wrap up this episode? No, no, I can't think of anything else we haven't really covered. So yeah, just thanks very much for, for inviting me on. I've really enjoyed uh, speaking with you and I hope the audience found it interesting and, and insightful. Fantastic. Thanks again, Tom. We'll catch up with you soon and looking forward to following Colt Wines and sharing more of the information and material with our listeners. Brilliant. Take care. Cheers for that. You hear that, Sam? That was me clinking a glass so i hope you have a glass as well even though it's probably 9 a.m for you yeah don't make me salivate johnny i'm trying not mm -hmm. to drink before noon these days well I'll, I'll tell you what i have i have a 2019 vintage pinotage <laughs> from a box <laughs> yes i love it yeah but actually it's funny because in uh in sri lanka all the wines are are dry because they I guess sweet wines go better with, with spicy food. And even on the box, there's a sticker that says goes well with spicy food. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh man. I, I appreciate in that episode that I totally messed up my lingo. I thought old wine was called vintage wine. Tom's like, well, all wine is a vintage. <laughs> it just depends well, on which vintage it is. Yeah. But at the same time, old I, wine, I, old wine. I, like I don't know, yeah, antique wine, <laughs> collector's wine. But I mean, when you when you say vintage car, you mean old car, even though you can mm -hmm. you technically can say, you know, this is a '95 vintage, you know, Honda Prelude, uh, almost collectible, but not not quite yet, or like a 2005, you know, um, Hyundai. I think that you know, yeah, I, I guess with wine, it's, you know, it, th this is the, the thing I, I dislike most about wine and, and wine snobs is that snobbery with the, and this is why I never got into it. It's, you know, for me, I like my wine drinkable. I don't care if it's one year old or five years old, you know, if it tastes good and I don't need to, you know, develop my palate to enjoy it. I, that's what I want. I, I, I really believe that wine is like cheese where, you know, if you if you get really into cheese and get really snobby, you get you eventually go towards blue cheese because that's like the the most pungent stuff. But mm -hmm. to a untrained cheese eater, it's disgusting. And I never want to get to that point where I only eat blue cheese or I only enjoy blue cheese or I only enjoy really pungent twenty year old wine. I think that's a very fair statement. Uh, I, I sort of view it in a similar light but I would, I like to have sort of a linear progression of appreciation for wine. And you do risk when you get to that one level where, um, talk, talk about the, the show that he actually the documentary that he suggested called sour grapes, but there's this group that's called angry men that formed. And I started watching sour grapes last night on Netflix. I actually stopped watching it 
because I didn't have a bottle of wine. And I'm like, you just can't watch this documentary <laughs> yeah, yeah. without wine. So I went and got a, a nice bottle of wine this morning and uh, I'm gonna, gonna watch it tonight. But there's this group that's called the Angry Men that's basically guys get around and, and everyone brings a bottle of wine and you, you know drink it and have a nice dinner. But it started because all these, all these sommeliers and people that really appreciated their wine would go, keep going to dinner parties and they would bring a really nice bottle of wine, like $150, $200 bottle of wine, when everyone else would bring like the yellow fin, you know, $10 bottle and it would piss them off. So they called the group Angry Men. And then mm. they, they formed this group where basically everyone's got to bring a really badass, really, really baller bottle. Um, so you do run that risk, like with anything, you get spoiled and, uh, and desensitized to the you know, to the, the middle grade stuff. Uh, and I don't ever want to get to that point where I'm like having a family dinner and they've got a $30 bottle of, of uh, California Napa, you know, California uh, cab out. And I'm like, I, I don't even want to drink this. Like I can't even enjoy this. Right. But yeah. there is such an infinite amount of wealth of uh, knowledge that you can acquire with grapes. I mean, it's really a, a lifetime pursuit of just, depending on how detailed you want to get with it, that I think it's, it's worth gaining knowledge as you go along because you will appreciate the, the really good wines and, uh, and some of those unique experiences that you'll have along the way all that much better. I, I definitely agree to a certain point. I think I for sure want to acquire the knowledge, you know, to, to be able to differentiate the different types of red wines or the different types of white wines and to know what pairs well with, you know, what type of food, for example. You know, maybe, you know, figure out, you know, do I like a Merlot better or do I like a, you know, you know, was it this, I don't mean, I remember what I'm drinking now, Pinot, Pinotage, <laughs> but, Pinotage. or like a Shiraz. South yeah. yeah, yeah, it's South, it's South Look African. That. Look at that. Yeah. Mm. Oh, good. Some See, Malaise very guys. good. So I would like to get to that point where I can tell the difference between, you know, the, the different, you know, wine varieties, because I, I think that's important and to be able to figure out what I like and when I like it. But at the same time, I'm perfectly happy with, you know, knowing I like the Merlot, but getting the Charles Shaw, the, the two buck Chuck, the three buck Chuck from Trader Joe's and being happy with it. Yeah, it's now like six dollars. Shut up. Great oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was researching this after the interview with Tom, tr trying to go back and look up what actually are the 10 biggest brands. And I'm going to disclose them for everybody's listening pleasure shortly but i found it really interesting that uh, a lot of these big brands and everyone can certainly appreciate this that through covid their sales have all increased like double digits 20 percent mm. and what yellowfin was saying was that i'm sorry yellowfin yellowtail was saying that when covid broke out in kind of march april there is this massive global stockpile of wine <laughs> uh, which I found humorous and interesting because, you know, I, I can remember that day when everyone realized that COVID's coming to the USA and everyone was like, what's, what's, no one knew what was going to happen. And we all rushed to Sam's club and loaded up a cart full of like dry foods. I still have this shit in my house. It's like fruit cups and oatmeal, like stuff I'm never, ever going to eat <laughs> unless <laughs> there's a shortage of food. And I don't even know what to do with it because I don't want to throw it away and waste it. So it's just sitting in my shelves now. Um, but I did the same thing. And I bought like a bunch of cheap and boxed wine along with it. And it seems like pretty much everyone in the world was kind of thinking the exact same thing. So Yellowtail said that, that you know, there's this massive surge in, in demand in a stockpile of wine. Um, but the demand hasn't come down off of that, that search. People are still buying it up. Um, I think just because so many people have gotten used to sitting at home and drinking wine every night that now it's like becoming a little bit more habit forming. Yeah, I, I can definitely see that. And people are spending more time at home, they're cooking at home more often. And mm -hmm. compared to wine prices in a restaurant, it's affordable to have wine every single day at home. You know, that's another thing I, another big reason why I don't like drinking wine at restaurants is it literally doubles your restaurant bill. So if you think, you know, going out to eat is expensive, going out to eat, having some, you know, some wine with your meal literally doubles your, your bill, which is terrible for, you know, investing or hitting, you know, financial freedom. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, not an inexpensive habit 
at all. And it can creep up so quickly. I spent way more this year on wine than I think almost anything else, you know, cause I wasn't traveling. I'm spending over a thousand dollars a month on wine and that's like, but the, the quality creeps up on you, right? You know, when you first start drinking wine, you're drinking the 10, 15, $20 bottles, $20 kind of an experience for you. Um, but you know, now I'm like the cheapest bottle I'm buying is like probably 30 and that's for just going over to see family. But if I'm drinking bottles by myself or with like my girlfriend, it's, you know, $50 on up and mm. I can easily be a thousand dollar a month bill. So it, it gets expensive. And to your point, Johnny, like e even aside from going out to eat, even if you're just at, getting a bottle to enjoy at your house with dinner, well, if you cook dinner for two or three people, you know, your, your costs are probably $20 on that meal. Well, if you just throw in a $20 bottle of, of kind of everyday drinking wine, there you go. It's just doubled. It's doubled your cost for that meal, even though you're not in a restaurant. Yeah. And wine's a scam. <laughs> That's all I gotta say. <laughs> what else no, we spend our yeah. money on, Johnny? What's, what's funny is uh, my girlfriend and I got invited to someone's house for dinner the, the other night. And, you know, this guy, like pretty wealthy guy, wealthy gentleman. And we wanted to bring something, obviously, you know, we don't want to seem like peasants going, coming over for, for free food. And the natural thing to do would be to pick up a bottle of wine. But I knew that whatever bottle of wine I was going to buy <laughs> was going to be more insulting than it would be appreciated. Mm -hmm. So I decided yeah. just, and I was like, I don't want to bring like a 20, you know, like a $30 bottle of wine or $40 bottle of wine to, you know, cause it just like, then I was spending 40 bucks to go out to go to some guy's house to, to have dinner. So I thought, yeah. what can I bring instead of a bottle of wine that would, you know, be kind of just like a gesture of goodwill. And I found the perfect gift. I picked up a pineapple on the way <laughs> and instead of handing him over a bottle, <laughs> handed him over a fruit. <laughs> I don't know if that's more insulting than a box of wine, but um, <laughs> it's, it's certainly more creative. It's something yeah. he's never seen before, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks for the pineapple. Yeah, we'll slice that up and serve it for dinner or for dessert. I mean, yeah, yeah. See, there you go. Um, all right. Well, let me, let me run down the top 10 wine brands of 2020 and see how many of these ring a bell to all the listeners out there. Uh, hey, was, I actually was, misspoke. Was great wall number one or no? No, I misspoke. They, the okay. two Chinese brands are in the top 10. Um, okay. But, you know, these move around quite a bit year to year. Yeah. So if you look at like a 2017 list compared to 2019 list, the top 10 are all different. Um, okay. I mean, most of them are still up in the top 10. But like, for instance, Jacob's Creek, that's mm -hmm. one that you see in Thailand all the time at 7-Eleven. That's not in the top 10 anymore. But in 2017, it was. Mm. Um, so number one, for all the U.S. listeners, this one will ring true, Barefoot. Barefoot is by a company called E&J Gallo. Uh, they were one that also reported sales increase of 20% during COVID. I see that stuff. I'm like, who drinks that shit? But mm -hmm. apparently a lot of people do. Number two, also by the company E.J. Gallo is Gallo. And Johnny, speaking of college graduation, this is what we drank at college graduation. Uh, my whole fraternity got Got like pasta and these gallons of Gallo. So that was one of my first wine experiences. But um, Gallo, I think it, everyone in the U.S. would be for, for sure aware of, it, at least passively, right? Okay. Uh, number three, this one might be the biggest and most reputable global brand of wine. Uh, at one point in China, they were buying this stuff for like $100 a bottle because they thought it was so prestigious. But... Thus, it's not. Coming in at number three is Yellowtail, oh. Bohemoth from Australia. Uh, number four, now we get into the Chinese brands, is Sheng Yi it's from okay. China. It's Chinese, China's oldest wine brand. And actually, I didn't even know they grew wine in China, but they have like six different estates where they grow this wine. Uh, and it's an old label. It was created in 1817, I believe. So 200 years old, this Sheng Yi wine from china number five a name that's synonymous with wine making mr robert mondavi people mr robert mondavi owned by constellation brands publicly traded stock you can check it out they're also a massive massive company 
40 billion dollar market cap is constellation brands with robert mondavi probably it's most well-known brand. Number six, another name uh, most, at least people in the U.S. will be familiar with, Sutter Home. Oh, Johnny, okay. Sutter Home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, number seven is actually a company that I'm not familiar with. It's an Australian brand, and it's the top-selling wine brand, wine label in the U.K., and that is Hardee's. Number six is Hardee's. Number eight, back to the Chinese brands, a wine label that I have had, um, and then you see in all like the hotels, pretty much everywhere in China, at least in the south of China, is Great Wall. Great Wall at number eight. Tastes like total shit, but... Yeah, yeah, um, I was going to imagine that. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> nevertheless, it's uh, you're sitting at a hotel in Shenzhen, sometimes better than drinking the beer. Okay. Uh, number nine is Castillero del Diablo by Concho y Toro. It's a behemoth out of Chile. Um, you'll see that wine all over the U S as well. Actually all over the world. you see that wine. Okay. Um, Contrary Choro is a huge, uh, huge winery wine producer, and they produce everything from kind of the, you know, $8 bottle range all the way up to the super exclusive, uh, several hundred dollar bottles. And number 10 to wrap out the top 10 is a brand that I'm not familiar with. It's called Echo Falls. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's an Australian company, also a very big seller in the UK. Uh, I did a quick look at them and it looks like they sell a lot of different flavored wines like rosés and also sort of mm, more like, yeah, like wine blends. Um, So I don't know if you'd call that a core wine brand, but they've got it up there as a top 10. So that rounds out the top 10 for 2020. Mm, interesting. I'm I'm very curious if these are the top 10 just because of distribution or just because of marketing. I'm assuming it's those two things. It, it, it can't be anything else. It's probably they have a like they probably have a low price point, you know, good marketing, good good distribution. So they kind of corner the market. Yeah, this the, this metric was based fully on case <clears throat> sales. So I'm sure that's both exporting and uh, domestic consumption. What is that, that the, the really cheap wine you get at 7-Eleven in, um, in Thailand? That's Jacob's Creek. No, no, it's not. There's, a, uh, there's another one that's even cheaper. Because w- I mean, whatever... Very well, yeah. it could be Sutter Home. It could be Sutter Home. They also no, it wasn't sell that. Robert, they sell Robert Mondavi now at 7-Eleven. No. Um, Jacob's Creek is everywhere in Thailand. No, like, I, I, I would sell, like they sell Thai brands now, Thai wine brands. Really? Uh, okay. That's, yeah. All right. Well, wh- whatever it is, I remember s- looking at the bottle, and, and I mean, I'll, I'll, it was always kind of terrible and really sweet. And I remember looking at the bottle and seeing the label like fruit wine or something, <laughs> and I realized that the cheapest stuff is not even made out of grapes. <laughs> what? Yeah. You know, like Apple? I don't know. I have no idea what it is. Or that's just kind of weird branding, but I, I'm pretty sure the way that they, they got it so cheap was instead of using pure grapes, it was like a, a mix of something. I have no idea. Like if somebody can correct me, but in general, wine in Thailand is both not good and very expensive. <laughs> well, they've actually, up. if you go up to the north, further north than Pai, like getting close to the Chinese border, they've got some beautiful <clears throat> vineyards that they've built up there that are, you know, very elegant. You, you could be sitting in, in Napa or anywhere else in the world. The wine is just awful though. It's just awful. I don't know if it'll ever get better if it's just like the, the, the geography and everything like that, but, uh, or if it just needs more time, but it's beautiful. I mean, it's worth a trip to go up there and hang out. Yeah. I, I remember some of my, my favorite days, uh, like of, of my life were one was going to a winery in Stellenbosch in South Africa. And for like, mm-hmm. I want to, I want to say mm-hmm. like seven bucks or something, something really cheap. It, they had a wine tasting where you had, you know, what, four or five different uh, glasses of wine. And then you also had a chocolate pairing in between each one. And I remember thinking, and I remember saying this to my, my girlfriend at the time, I was like, why didn't we come here every day? Like, wh- why did we wait until our last day in Cape Town to come to, to come to the winery? I would have happily just done this every day. That is legitimately one of the, f- the best places in the world. Hands yeah, down. I see that. It is, but, it is. Some of my favorite days of, of my life were in Stellenbosch as well. The value, you know, the, some of the estates are like multi-billion dollar estates. 
second to nowhere in the world. And the wine tastings are like $2. The value yeah. is insane. It's crazy. It's crazy. You know what? Actually, we ended up going back the next day, like before we had to fly out. And we took a, they had like a, a picnic option or something where they'll give you a bottle of wine and like, you know, some food in a basket with a blanket. And you just like hang out, you know, on the grounds of the winery. And even that was really cheap. And I was thinking like, this is amazing. If I lived here, I'd be here all the time. Like I'd, I would literally be there every weekend. It's, it's really like a little slice of heaven. Actually, Stellenbosch, I was like, it wasn't like the Chiang Mai feel, but it was quaint and cozy, like getting out of Cape Town. And the, the, the nature and geography is like in the temperature. It's all just like a little, little slice of heaven. It is a, a really, really special place in the world. If you guys have a chance, if you haven't been, make sure you go there, man. It's just, it's just awesome. 100%. The other place I, I remember that I had a really good time was with you, Sam. Do you remember which winery it was? You know, trying to guess. Uh, oh God, Moldova. Yeah, that was yeah. the highlight of that country. I mean, that was literally <laughs> was. the only good thing about that country, <laughs> right? And like, that's that's a perfect example. It's just like a chill place, beautiful nature. I don't even remember the wine, but everyone's nice. It, like, you could just lay down a picnic blanket and be happy forever. Like. It never seems to get old. Um, one thing I really find interesting, actually, this was in Stellenbosch, when I would go around to the different vineyards and all the people that were producing the wine, I would always ask them, like, how much wine do you drink in a day? And very consistently, at least the males will say, you know, drink about a bottle a day, you know, a couple of glasses at lunch in the afternoon, a couple of glasses at evening, uh, dinner and friends and family. And they all live really long. They all live into like, you know, all the men will be living into their 90s and they're drinking a bottle of wine every single day. So it just goes to show that like, it, it's not necessarily an unhealthy thing to do as long as it's with a balanced, uh, you know, a balanced lifestyle and you, your stress levels are low. Yeah, I, I could definitely see that. That's why we got this uh, box of wine here that I'm going through. <laughs> full, yeah. of, full of preservatives. <laughs> No, box wine is great. Like, I, 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 at least from from what I've read or heard, it's it had a bad uh, rap because it used to always be the whatever the cheapest wine was. But some producers in Australia and other places would start putting good wine in boxes because the the Terra Pack is a better technology, you know, than the cork. It less it doesn't let any air in, and once you open it and you pour a glass. I mean, first off, it aerates the wine as you're pouring because it like it just squirts out, so it's automatically adding that you know the the air to it, which you you know which I guess you want with red wine. And then second, it automatically seals it, so you can pour a glass of wine per day and not have to worry about the the bottle going bad. You know, after you know four or five days. Well, it's never a problem at my house trying to make a whole <laughs> bottle on a night. There you go. Uh, but I do, it, you know, it's interesting that because I know Australia is getting rid of all corks, or at least that's a rumor I heard. So you like Penfolds, you can go buy a couple hundred dollar bottle from them and it'll be a screw top. And mm -hmm. it seems so weird, right? To un just screw off a metal top of a couple hundred dollar bottle. But um, I, don't, I think it's par partially for environmental reasons and partially be for the points that you just said that um, it actually is, it helps preserve the wine a little bit better. Yeah, it's a pure. I mean, like, I mean, all the problems with having like what a corked wine, like, it's it's because it's old primitive technology. I mean, they invented the cork because that was the best technology they had at the time. <laughs> now there's other other ways to to store it, and you know, it's not just about the the the, the history. I guess you know, it's yeah, you know, it's modern production. Yeah. So this has been fun. I mean, I just wanted to leave the listeners with a couple of other references. If anyone's interested in learning more about wine and appreciate, you know, wine appreciation, I would highly recommend, uh, there's an app called Masterclass. They basically go through and like get experts in every field to record sort of a, you know, probably a four to eight hour dedicated session about their skill or expertise. And James Suckling, who is a, a wine uh, you know, a sommelier, but he goes around and, and rates wine, or I guess you call him a wine critic. Uh, they did a masterclass with him, which was really, really cool. I mean, not only is it entertaining, but it's, uh, it's, it's information packed. 
I think you guys will really enjoy it. So check that out. And also the documentary on Netflix that Tom recommended was called Sour Grapes. Uh, I checked it out last night. Um, I haven't watched it all, but it, you know, I watched the first 10 minutes and it looked really, really cool. So I'll be cracking a bottle of uh, Napa Cab to that tonight. Nice. So big question on everyone's mind is, Sam, uh, would you invest in wine? You know, whether, you know, with this fund or, or otherwise? I've looked at it sporadically in the past, not in such an organized manner as this. Where I find it interesting would be first to build out a private cellar at my own place with like <laughs> wines that I'm not sure that this would align with my financial investment goals. Um, not to say that there's not money to be made. It's just something that I would prefer to drink, to be frank. You know, I'd rather buy a thousand dollar bottle and, uh, and drink it for some big celebration than buy a thousand dollar bottle and try to make, uh, you know, a few hundred dollars off of it in, in a few years. So I think it's really interesting. And I think it's something like art that good times, bad times, it's going to appeal to the 1% of people out there. And as long as the 1% of people out there continue to get wealthy and need more and interesting ways to spend their money, wine, art, collectibles are all going to continue to go up in price. Basically, as long as capitalism survives, all, I think all those asset prices are going to go up in our lifetime. So um, I think it, it's a very interesting investment perspective. But for me, initially, I'm just more interested in drinking it. Good answer, Sam. I, I think and you, you could probably guess where I stand. <laughs> um, I think I, you want you want to drink. Well, you want to drink it, but you want to drink like the box, stuff. the cheap stuff. Yeah. Well, what I want to do is I want to take that thousand dollars and buy you know a case of a uh, of Charles Schaub, and then take the mm-hmm. the remaining nine hundred and fifty dollars and invest that into something else, <laughs> into like an index fund or something. I, I think of yeah. wine as one of the worst possible investments in the world. It's, it's fragile. <laughs> you can break it. Uh, it's consumable. So once you, you know, crack it open and enjoy it, it it's gone and it's worthless. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it basically doesn't have an infinite shelf life, so it can go bad uh, or, you know, can lose value over time. Uh, and you have to store it. And it has a very, like, you know, low, you know, uh, resellability as in, it's, it's not very liquid asset, uh, even though it is liquid. <laughs> and <laughs> so I do, I do see, you know, why it exists, this market exists. And I can see why people, some people would invest a percentage of their money into it. Uh, because it's for the bragging rights and it's for people who have nothing better to do with their time because they have so much money <laughs> that they become super wine snobs. And instead of, it's, it's instead of uh, buying the, you know, $10,000 bottles to drink, they're buying the, you know, the thousand dollar bottles to invest in and say, you know, still have the bragging rights of talking about it and, and owning it and showing it off. So I think for them, and actually maybe even in your case, it's probably a good investment. It's a very better investment than, you know, drinking that thousand dollars. Cause then it's gone. It's probably better to, you know, buy that thousand dollar bottle of wine if you really want it, but they just kind of put it on your shelf for a few years and then sell it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. There's so many different ways you could play it. I, I like the idea of investing something like, you know, let's say you invested 50 or a hundred thousand, uh, you let it, let the returns build up for a few years. And assuming you do have returns, you know, get your money out and then whatever was in the returns celebrate with some good friends or family and, you know, drink some, some really good wines. But the challenge is like, if you're drinking a four or $5,000 bottle of wine and no one in the group, like if I bring you Johnny, right? No offense. We're drinking yeah, it. Seriously. Like that bottle will disappear quick and we'll just be like, I don't even really know what I drank. Right. Yeah. And that's where the, that's where the appreciation comes into play. Cause like if you're a sommelier and you just, you knew exactly like that vintage and what was happening in that, that climate in Bordeaux, maybe, you know, for instance, like now in Napa, they're having all these fires, right? And that might produce some really interesting vintages. And you might look back in 20 years and be like, oh, I remember that 2020, like COVID and there's all the fires and like, this is, it just turned out to be a spectacular vintage. And then you can just sit there and like with every sip, you're just like melting with oh, appreciation. It's, it's so but, smoky um, and pungent. Yeah. Well, <laughs> 
And <laughs> when uh, Zach and I were in Hong Kong, when Bitcoin crossed 10,000 for the first time, you know, sold that, sold that Bitcoin and bought a bottle of Penfolds Grange, which at the, the restaurant in Hong Kong was like, I think it was 1100 US dollars. And uh, it was, it was awesome to celebrate like the Bitcoin win in a sense, but I didn't appreciate it because I've had bottles of Penfolds that are like $80 that were just as good. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure some Mali would be able to tell the difference. But for me, I was like $100 bottles, just as good as this $1,000 bottle. But it was still, you know, it still pays dividends in the memory bank. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Uh, speaking of uh, memories, I, I just remembered a, a experience I had with counterfeit wine. Mm. Do tell. Yeah, I was over at a friend's house and I opened his fridge and it was full of bottles of Dom Perignon, just packed to the rim. And I remember turning to him thinking, saying like, why do you have this? And he says, oh, uh, he's like, hey, uh, go ahead and take one home. He's like, and I was like, I was like, what? Like, like, where did you get this from? And why do you have this? And he kind of just chuckled. He's like, yeah, the girls love it. I took it home, didn't really think you know, about it too much, and I examined the bottle a bit more, and I realized it was a stick-on label on some you know, cooks or something, something like some cheap bottle of champagne that you would get at a supermarket. That's weird. It, it, that, so I think this is what the Sour Grapes documentary is going to be about. I just had no idea that there's some operation around the world that's somehow like manipulating and, and and finding a way to sell this but you know wherever there's a market you often find a black market so yeah well uh, i think in, in his case a, he, interesting. i'm pretty sure he just yeah. printed him and he like this was like a small time personal thing where he went to kinko's printed out a bunch of wine uh, uh, dump it on wine label just impressed girls that came over I, I guess it's actually that you know, relatively that easy to make, right? Like you right? fill yeah. up an old bottle. We, we used to do it with, we actually used, used to do it with vodka in college, like where we would buy <laughs> this cheap plastic bottle, you know, crap, mm -hmm. uh, I forget even what it was called. And we would refill Grey Goose bottles for when we had parties. And it was more like a joke. Like we, most people knew <laughs> about it, but uh, it was kind of a scam in a way, actually. Yeah. So um, I guess it's not that difficult to do, especially when bottle sales can be, can fetch five ten thousand dollars a bottle there's uh there's certainly going to be people that are chasing that opportunity yeah so there you guys have it those are our opinions on investing in wine and drinking wine uh i do hope to visit some more vineyards and have some fun and have another glass with you sometime uh in 2021 sam which is coming up soon yeah it's going to be a better year hopefully for everybody um, guys, we also want to do a follow-up episode to this that's actually about wine production uh, in the vineyard or the winery. So if you guys know any, any families or anyone that owns a vineyard out there in the world, we'd love to talk to them. Feel free to shoot us an email um, and we'd like an introduction. I think there's, there's more to unpack on wine as an asset class, the agricultural side, the production side, the distribution side, and uh, we just want to know more. Definitely. Uh, so big thanks again to Derek for setting up this interview and to our Patreons. You guys are the reason why we we're able to have Derek on, on the team and to literally have these episodes. Uh, so this week, I want to shout out our latest VIP Patreon, Richard Petey from investing.io. Big thanks and big thanks to all the rest of our Patreons for supporting. Uh, we'd love to, to meet all of you guys for a glass of wine one of these days. Absolutely. Big shout out to Tom for coming on the show. And um, yeah, it's been a, it's going to be a great quarter ahead. And man, I'll tell you what, the year's ending better than it started. Uh, well, actually, it started pretty good. It was just March. It started <laughs> to suck. Uh, but 2021 is looking even better. Let's get this vaccine rolled out and let's all get back to, to living our full lives. All right. See you guys. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment folios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.